Before I introduce Randy Olson, I'd, I'd like to make some acknowledgments. First and foremost, the uh, organize, the other members of the organizing committee, Robin Bowles from the library, Farah Fatima from Geography and Environment, and uh, Valentina Ferretti from Biology. I'd also like to thank our uh, sponsors, and without their financial support, this wouldn't have been possible. Uh, Kel Weeder and Jean Ann Linney in the Arts and Sciences, uh, Russ Gardner in Biology, uh, Frank Galgano in uh, Geography and Environment, Joe Lucia in uh, Fall V, Dean Fitzpatrick in Nursing, Jane Morris in the Center of Undergraduate Research and Fellowships, the Mendel Science Experience Program, Tom Ar Ar not Ar Ar Tom in Sociology, <laughs> and Tom Topino in Psychology. I thought I was going to do it in one breath, but there was no way. Uh, Anyway, I'd like to, and if you haven't seen, the best introduction to Randy, I think, is in Ted Winston's article in Today's Illinois. So if you haven't seen that, you should pick that up. It's really quite a, quite a good piece. Um, Randy bridges the gap, as, as uh, Ted says. He's, he's that bridge between the arts and the sciences. And he's a, a scientist by training and an artist by um, experience. experience. And I will let him tell you a bit more about his own story. Uh, but if you haven't read the book, um, uh, don't be such a scientist. I, I highly recommend it. Randy, thanks for coming. Great to be here. Thank you very much. Um, before I start offending everybody, let's begin by finding out just how susceptible the crowd is. How many people here are, are related to science stuff? You're involved with science type things? Oh boy, here we go. <laughs> Okie dokie. <laughs> All right, so brace yourself. I mean, some scientists get really offended by this, and I get these hate emails. I was on a uh, the NPR show a couple months ago in Salt Lake City and this one biochemist went crazy sending me all these hate emails calling me a scumbag everything else like that for my basic message so there you go um, it means that you may be upset offended by my basic starting message which is the news that I think that I have the proof to show that scientists have in fact descended from humans uh, not only the scientists descended from humans but that the divide happened relatively recently and we can see this to start with by looking at just a typical human phylogeny. If we look here at representative group of humans up here uh, and what we call the outgroup over here, the scientist, uh, the typical thinking is that scientists split off from humans long, long ago, way back before the age of humans and dinosaurs hanging out together, before the time of jellyfish, all the way back in the time of sponges, and that that's when the whole process began of, of scientists going off on their own. But in fact, what I believe is that we have the proof nowadays, um, starting with a common ancestor from only a few hundred years ago, referred to as Renaissance man, uh, who was in fact an individual that was capable of conducting both literary novel writing as well as scientific inquiry at the same time. So only a few hundred years ago, there were these people who could do the same thing at once, both literary and science, scientific pursuits. Uh, but more importantly, it, the evidence that I base this on are three items which I refer to as the storytelling vestiges. And what these are is three observations of the ways in which scientists communicate to this day that I think are vestiges that reveal how recent their past is that they were um, back a part of normal society. So the first of which is the way in which scientists communicate. And I was a scientist once upon a time, as I'll tell you about in a minute. And I remember so clearly going to scientific meetings and after a couple of days standing out in the lobby and listening to some scientists talk and somebody saying, has anybody heard any good talks this meeting? And invariably someone else would say, well, yeah, you know, this morning I heard this woman give this talk where she told this amazing story about these crabs that climb up on these boulders and they do this and that and the fish come out here. But the key word that popped out to me was the word story. And I remember this at scientific meetings. I remember it at the Benthic Ecology meetings, people talking about somebody giving a talk where they told a good story. That is a vestige of once upon a time, there wasn't this phobia about the word story and storytelling in the science world that they actually did tell stories themselves and were willing to, uh, to talk about it in open language. Um, secondly, the writing of science. And this becomes a very clear vestige, I firmly believe, and I'm interested in anybody who disagrees with this, um, which is that stories, as told in the literary world in the, play, in the form of novels and plays and, um, and even screenplays, they all have a fairly straightforward structure beneath them, a three-part structure, a beginning, a middle, and an end. And so if we take a look at the way in which a story from the literary world is structured, what we see is it begins with the first act, the beginning, and a bunch of stuff happens, yada, yada, yada. And then we have a second act where we head off on a journey and then a third act where it's all brought together in a conclusion and finally, blah. Um, 
Now when we take a look at the way in which a scientific research paper is written in almost every journal in the world, if you go to that journal, it has a page called Guidelines for Writers, and what you'll see is they give you this same basic three-act structure. You're meant to write your paper in the form of an introduction, where you lay out what your problem is and bring it together to pose the question that you're investigating, a middle part, which is the journey, the methods and results that you're conducting, and then eventually a third part where you're allowed to engage in a little bit more subjective exercise of speculation. That's the discussion there. Three basic sections, and here's the important part. When we conduct this very sophisticated, what's called an alignment analysis, and take a look at how these two sequences line up, what you see is, in fact, a perfect match. And there is your storytelling vestige. One has evolved from the other. It is there in the sequence. Uh, and thirdly, the basic thinking of how science is done. I have spent years reading all this science philosophy stuff in which they talk about the scientific method as though it's some sacred, highly distinctive pursuit, uh, when in fact, I think it's no different than the basic writing of a novel. It's the same process, the telling of a story. You set up a source of tension or conflict and you resolve it. And you set up a question in a novel, you write a murder mystery, it's a whodunit novel, you set up the question of who done it. You then pursue all these hypotheses of who the murderer is and then you eventually solve it and you relieve that tension at the end um, with the resolution. Science is the same thing. You pose a problem and you seek the solution. You pose a question, you go answer it, and you know the best scientists are the ones that people talk about. That person asks really good questions. The important thing for science communication is to realize how similar it is rather than how different and unique it is, I think. And in the course of trying to tell interesting stories, it's important to know a few fundamental properties of good stories, and I'm going to get into this in a bit, but here's one at the beginning, which is that a good story consists of a good journey. A good journey consists of going from point A to point B. Something actually happens. So if I tell you the story of a man who goes down to the harbor um, in New Jersey, loads his boat up, and goes out to sea, and two weeks later washes up on the coast of Portugal, that guy's probably got an interesting story to tell you. He went from point A to point B. If I tell you the same story of the guy, loaded his boat up, sat there for two weeks in the harbor, never left the harbor, his story's probably not going to be as interesting. Good stories consist of going somewhere on a journey, so towards that end, let me give you a little bit of my background, what I've been through, because it's been a bit of a journey. I started off my professional life in the science world and have undertaken this journey into the world of cinema. So here's the basic chronology. Once upon a time, I was an undergraduate at the University of Washington, studied Rocky Intertidal Ecology on the Olympic Peninsula. Ended up doing my PhD and working in Australia for my field work. Spent an entire year living on this wonderful island, Lizard Island, the great, on the north end of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, oops. And eventually I went back to Australia as a postdoc studying one of the great stories in the world's oceans that remains to be told in a very effective manner, which is the story of the crown of thorn starfish uh, problem throughout cor coral reefs in the Pacific. Um, then I became a professor at the University of New Hampshire and then something crazy happened. My entire world turned sideways and shortly after receiving tenure, I departed, moved to Los Angeles and entered into film school at the University of Southern California. Spent three years in the graduate film production program and then got out, got ready to make these great and wonderful movies, and then I had five years, which I refer to as my lost years, um, <laughs> in which I pretty much lived on the streets, uh, no uh, health insurance, and lived off unemployment off and on, uh, some very grim years, but still a lot of fun, and eventually, uh, in 2002, reconnected with one of my heroes in marine biology world, Dr. Jeremy Jackson, um, and he's one of the world's top coral reef ecologists. And together, we created a, a, a project that's been going for 10 years now called Shifting Baselines, and it's built around this term which refers to the, the loss of perspective um, in, under, in perceiving nature, uh, failing to keep track of baselines, and, so, uh, and how that radiates out to so many other problems in our society. But the project was a partnership between ocean conservation and my filmmaking resources in Hollywood, and I began writing and directing a series of short films and, and TV commercials, all sorts of things. Um, and from there, I began to get more interested in looking at the ways in which science is communicated and the controversies and issues that have begun to crop up. And in part, I feel that a lot of these controversies are fueled uh, in part by the inability of the science world to communicate effectively and the environmental world. And so that led to this first feature film called Flock of Dodos that was about the controversy over the teaching of evolution versus intelligent design, which we will be viewing this evening at 740 in the... Driscoll 134. Driscoll 134. Um, 
And this movie ended up premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival. It aired on Showtime for a couple years. And as I did screenings, people began saying to me, can't you make a similar movie? It's really fun and entertaining movie. Can't you make a similar movie for the issue of global warming? And eventually by 2008, I ended up making um, a movie that's somewhat different. We'll be viewing this tomorrow night, Sizzle, a global warming comedy. And then out of all these experiences, this is about global warming, um, out of all these experiences, I sat down in 2009 and wrote this book called Don't Be Such a Scientist, Talking Substance in an Age of Style. And that book has really ended up kind of being the, the presentation of the synthesis of everything that I've learned in this long journey from the science to the cinema world and communications. And uh, at the core of it are four main chapters um, in which they really are kind of the broad dynamics of how to communicate large amounts of information to bigger, broader audiences. That's the central challenge. And everybody said this for you know, years. I've been listening to this, people saying, how can we get beyond just preaching to the converted, just speaking to the people that already know the language of what, what they're interested in? Um, and the answer to that is in this book. It's at the core of the book, this third chapter. It's about storytelling, the telling of stories. That's the secret way that you can reach a bigger, broader audience and get beyond the, the limited audience for your topic. But what's interesting is as I wrote this book, my older brother's a lawyer and he was reading parts of it and he began telling me, you know, you could write the same book for the legal profession. You could call it Don't Be Such a Lawyer. You could do it for the accounting world. You could do it for doctors. I work with doctors and workshops now. And the basic principles are very robust. The four chapters are about the tendency of academic people to be overly cerebral, overly literal minded, to not be so good at telling stories. And the fourth chapter is called Don't Be So Unlikable. And that's a <laughs> fundamental part of communication as well. So there you go. Um, but what this has led me deeper and deeper into is this concern and realization that the broad, the basic principles of communication are very general. And that really people should be careful about the idea of calling themselves a science communicator. And I'm seeing there are all these big societies and meetings and things now for we're all science communicators. Yeah, but you should all really be working on broad communication and just seeing that, that the telling of stories uh, works for every different profession. Now, there are some fairly unique elements to the world of science that cause problems in communication that I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. But um, towards that end, Right now, people always ask, you know, so what are you busy with? And the answer to that is the biggest project I'm doing for the past two years is I'm doing a documentary feature film about this man. He is the last surviving officer from the Bataan Death March in World War II. He's 94 years old, and this is a movie all about his story, but also all these chapters of, of history, and it involves his personal life, his love story, his marriage, all these sorts of things. Huge thing, doesn't have one drop of science or environmentalism in it. And it's putting me to the test of seeing how storytelling works. Uh, and I'm learning so much from it. Now, one of the things you may have noticed in looking at this picture is that this guy has blue eyes, and I have blue eyes. And he has very little hair, and I have very little hair. And so you may be wondering, is there any chance you're related to this guy? Uh, and the answer to that question is right here inside my hand. But I am not going to let you know the answer right now, because this is what storytelling is about. It's about taking information and hiding it away from you and playing this little game whether you want to or not. And whether you like it or not with human beings, they enjoy this game. It's a fundamental way over the ages we've evolved to communicate information. And it's very frustrating if you're a very literal-minded scientist and you just want to get to the facts. And in fact, that is the core dynamic that is a problem with this communication stuff, particularly in the science world. It's a great article in The New Yorker in January this year. Um, this is called Streaming Dreams, and this is about how YouTube this spring is launching this massive campaign to try and steal about a third to a quarter of the entire uh, viewing audience out of mainstream television and try and bring them onto the internet to watch shows on YouTube. They're opening up 20 channels, each pegged with different celebrities. But this is such a good article because it's very analytical as well about what's going on with that. And what it talks about is this fundamental divide between television and the internet. It's not the same, these two worlds. People sit down and watch television, and we know their viewing habits. The average American views television for like six hours a day, and people plop themselves down, they watch TV on and on and on. They watch these shows that go on and on and on. But on the internet, people, they tend to jump all around the place, and the average viewing time for YouTube is only a few minutes, and that's what YouTube knows as part of their ch challenge is can they change the viewing habits of people on YouTube? But the fundamental divide between those two things is that television is an entertainment medium. And people go there to be entertained. They don't go there quite so much to seek information. And so they go to the internet to seek information. 
And the divide between that is the difference between abundance versus scarcity. So when you talk about Google or something like that, they're all about making information abundant. They want to get all the information they can to you. When you go to television, you're watching your favorite cop show or something like that, that's about scarcity. They're telling you a story. They're trying to put the answer to the question of who done it inside their hand and hide it away from you and play this game with you. So that's the divide right there is internet versus television, information versus entertainment, abundance versus scarcity. And as scientists, you're sort of trained in this side of it here. Abundance. You go to a scientific meeting and everybody's there to find out what have you found out and you just want to get the information out to them as quickly as possible. So that's part of the frustration and the challenge. Now, one of the things I've been doing for the past four or five years is, you know, a very cool thing is happening. All this communication stuff is changing very rapidly. And um, once upon a time, film is a language, and once upon a time in this country, everybody could read the language of film, but only a few people could speak in the language of film because of technology. You know, 30, 40 years ago, you had to have access to all this big, sophisticated equipment. Now, with all the new video cameras, like the one we have back there, you can, for very little money, shoot your own videos. And with laptops like this, you can put it onto the footage on the laptop and edit your own video. So lots of scientists are doing this, and it's wonderful. It's really fun. So I have developed this thing over the last five years, going to the AGU meeting, American Geophysical Union, and the Ocean Sciences meeting, um, of encouraging scientists to send us their five minutes or less videos. And then I pick 10 of them, and we put together a panel. And the last two times, we've, I've now la labeled it, named it the S factor, kind of like the X factor. And uh, what I do is I bring a couple of my filmmaking uh, buddies from Hollywood with me. So these, we did this at AGU last December, and these are two of my film school classmates. I did it again at the Ocean Sciences in February. This is an actress, screenwriter friend of mine. That's an actor, improv instructor friend of mine. And then we do like American Idol. We show each video, and each one gets 15 minutes. You show the five-minute video. Then we offer up our thoughts and comments, have the filmmaker come up and discuss it with them. And it's wonderful. It's really fun. And it's just, it's a joint workshop thing where it's not criticizing like your movie's terrible. It's like, that's interesting. Have you thought about, you know, shaping your story into this and that? And in fact, when it comes to making these sorts of videos, there's two fundamental steps for you if you want to make your own. And you all, by the way, whether you like it or not, especially your graduate students, the day is coming where you're all going to be doing this. You know, it's becoming a mode of communication. You're all going to, you, you find it right now, I'm, I'm being told by some of these science organizations, you know, that here's your grant and you're going to make a website and you're going to make these videos. It's, it's becoming more and more obligatory. Um, and so <clears throat> you might as well start learning about this. And there's two parts. First is to shoot some video and put it on your laptop and glue it all together into something. That's step one. But step two then, once you've mastered the ability to glue together a bunch of cool scenes like a you know, family home movie, Step two is now, can you shape it into a story? And a story is something that does three things. It grabs your attention, it holds your attention as it takes you on a journey, and then it pays off what your attention was fixed on with, with usually a question that's posed. So can you do that? Can you shape your footage into something that's gonna grab our interest and get us thinking about what it is you're doing? Can you guide us on a little journey? And then can you eventually give us a satisfying answer to that, that question when it's revealed? That's what storytelling is about. So we do this. Um, at AGU and so here we are in action in February and there's one of the filmmakers looking kind of annoyed with me or whatever as I'm trying to offer up some comments um, but here's one of my favorite little experiences so far in watching all these things so the, the first thing that you see with the videos that come in is that scientists don't tell stories as I said they're all about the abundance and I'll talk about this in a minute but secondly um, this was one of the videos in the last round that didn't end up using but this is about um, people went out on a ship, did the standard thing you do in oceanographic work. They go out middle of the ocean, and they had this instrument array that's two miles down. It's been out there for a couple of years. And when you get out there, you need to collect that array. The way you do it is you put a sound device over the side. You send down a sound signal. There's an acoustic couple down there that picks up the signal, releases, and then this thing has buoys on it, floats to the surface, and you retrieve it. Um, when I was a scientist, I was out on cruises where we did that. I remember people almost down their hands and knees praying to Jesus that this acoustic couple would actually work and release this array because this is hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of equipment there. This is two years worth of data. If it does not surface, if it's tangled up down there, then there's two years of data they don't have. So entire livelihoods are based around this simple little process, that one moment of click, is it gonna float? Um, what a great dramatic device. 
to use for telling a story, you know, to hold the viewer in suspense as we set it up and we say, we put the device in there. I mean, think of all the reality shows that you watch. This is what reality shows are made of, you know, and we're, now we're gonna spend the next half an hour with everybody pacing back and forth saying, when there's no sign of it yet, it hasn't surfaced. Oh my God, my career's ruined. Uh, so then this guy sends in this video in which they have that exact moment. And what does he do in his video? We put the device over the side. Sometimes it doesn't work, but today, bing, it worked perfect. <laughs> And there's your difference between a scientist and a storyteller. The storyteller sets it up and now draws it out, drives you crazy, makes you want to kill them. And if they do it well, you don't mind that. If they do a lousy job, then you really do want to kill them. And you think, oh, this is, you know, they're manipulating me. But that's the art of it all. Um, so think about that. And then, of course, if you're a scientist, what you really want is you want there to be a science of this thing. Because anytime we're looking at something, the first thing we want, let's, let's look at what are the underlying principles, the formulas, the equations, how can we predict how these sorts of things work. And so that would be the, store, the science of storyomics. So you would want to run to the internet and search the, the term storyomics and start reading about the science of storytelling called that. Um, unfortunately, all you'll find right now is references back to me, because that's a term I made up and it doesn't exist so far. Um, but someday, you know, we've got genomics, we've got all these other omics, proteomics, so why not a storyomics? Um, and there are some basic principles. When I was in film school, I, I saw, you know, one of the first kind of symptoms of this. In the mid 90s, there was a program that came out called Dramatica. And this was some people who had gotten together and tried to basically make some software that is formulaic um, calculations for you. And so a bunch of my screenwriter friends went running out and said, you know, we've got this awesome software, and all you gotta do is you sit down, and it's got a bunch of questions, you know, you have to tell it, who's your, what's the name of your antagonist? Who's your protagonist? What are their characteristics? What's the quest? What's the mission that they're on? Who's the this, who's the that? You fill in all these blanks, and then this thing just churns through, and then it spits out a list of, here's all the scenes you need to write and what needs to happen in each one of these scenes. Your hero needs to go and talk to this wise man and go off and do this and that. Um, and for two or three years on their website, they had all these quotes from big time action screenwriters saying, this thing's awesome. Well, if you look at their website today, 15 years later, all you really see, there's no more of the quotes from famous people on there. All you see are all these user groups, um, like how I use Dramatica and my aha Dramatica moment. And basically, it, it's not the miracle that they want. It's not the science of storytelling. They're still trying to figure out there's some good things to be gotten out of it, but storytelling is an art and there's no science to it, you know, that definitive science to it yet. But that said, there are definitely some core principles, and these, I think, are important things, and I'm gonna give you one eventually here that I think is unbelievably powerful, and I'll be interested to engage in any in disagreements on that. Uh, but this is just to show you that it is definitely not a science still at this point. This is just a few weeks ago, Walt Disney Studios announced uh, Monday that it would be taking a $200 million second quarter write down related to the science fiction flop, John Carter. John Carter provides a stark reminder that profiting from art is not an exact science. So there you go, a lot of very sad and depressed people about that. Um, but that said, here's what I wanna go through now for the second part of this talk, which is, um, I'm gonna state it in three simple phrases here. Science has interesting and important things for the world. Notice the inflection of my voice, and, but, Scientists lack the basic dynamics of communication, i.e. storytelling. Therefore, they had better find new respect for the humanities. So notice that word, but, and the hand gesture. That will come into play in a moment. Uh, so let's begin by talking about what is a story. And as I was saying, I see these videos made by scientists and they don't tell stories. So one of the great dreams come true that happened with my book was um, a couple of, in, let's see, 2010, a group of people from the communications section there at the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta uh, contacted me and invited me to come there and spend a day with them. They were all, you know, really like my book. Uh, and I love epidemiology and this was just like fantastic. You know, the epicenter for the study of epidemiology, 10,000 employees there and they, it's unbelievable. They have 500 or so communications people. They have their own television station there. This is the cutting edge of broad communication of science and technical type of information. Uh, so in preparation for going there, I ended up uh, talking to, you know, some of the communications people. And this one woman told me about, she said, you know, we want you to come in and talk with some of our scientists because they have a hard time. This is a culture clash you get at all these scientific institutions. You have these flakes called communicators and you have these heavy thinkers called scientists. And the two worlds clash a lot. It's oil and water. It's very difficult. So in talking with this woman, she said, um, 
said, you know, one of the things that happens to us is we go and we sit down with the scientists and we just ask them, what do you want us to communicate? And the scientists say, we want you to tell the story of the CDC. And then we say to them, what is the story of the CDC? And they toss their hands up and they say, you know, it's all the things we do here. It's the people that work here. It's the equipment that we've got. It's the diseases that we, we cure. It's all the amazing things we've, we do. And then the communicators say, that's not a story. That's exposition. That's a bunch of information you're stringing together there. That's how a story begins, but it's not even started, you know, not even gotten through the first act there. And that's the fundamental divide is understanding this this split between exposition, which is usually put together with the word and, you know, it's these people and this equipment and these locations and these studies versus storytelling. So storytelling has got this fundamental structure and there's all the information there. Exposition, that's fine. If I'm going to tell you the story of a murder mystery, I'm going to begin by taking you to a small town and I'm going to tell you, and here's some people live here, and here's their house, and here's their backyard. I'm going to give you a whole bunch of information struck to, uh, strung together with and. But eventually, we're going to hit this kind of optimal point where something's going to happen. We're going to find a dead body in that small town. A question's going to be posed, and now we're going to go off on a journey to try and solve the riddle of who killed that. Eventually, the second act will lead us through the ups and downs. We'll get to an answer, resolve that. And then if I've done a good job and really answered that in a satisfying manner, then you're going to grant me the ability to now get up on my pedestal and start pontificating about what this all means. And this is what you do once again in your science papers. You've got to see the similarities. If you write a good paper and you've got amazing data, your audience will let you start synthesizing. You know, what this little study on these little ants over here in this piece of the forest mean is that all around the world, blah, 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 generalize on out. Same basic process. So, um, so if that's the structure of a story then, the next question and a really reasonable quiet criteria for you to present to me is what is a good story and can you give us an example of a good story? And let me tell you, I am not that great of a storyteller, but I know a good one when I see one. And some of you know who Neil deGrasse Tyson is. You see him on The Daily Show. He's been on there like 10 times. Um, he is astrophysicist, the director of the New York Observatory. And about three years ago, um, they had this big event in Hollywood where the National Academy of Sciences started a project out there called the Science and Entertainment Exchange. And the goal of the project is to try and improve the accuracy of science that's in these big budget Hollywood movies because lots of mass audience of America gets their science from those big movies. Uh, so they put together this one day event and on this theme, um, they had 250 of the best directors and writers from big budget movies and TV in Hollywood came to this thing. You can imagine the stakes were enormous. You know, these are the shortest of attention span people and I deal with them day in and day out and you cannot hold their attention if you're not bombarding them with stimulation. Um, so they put up basically, I think their, their best hope for trying to hold the attention of these people with Neil deGrasse Tyson. They had him uh, give the opening little talk and in this talk, he told this story. So, <clears throat> He began by saying, you know, in the 1990s, like so many of you, mid-90s, I went and saw this wonderful movie called Titanic. And he said, I love this movie. It was so much fun. Um, and the most amazing thing for him, being an astrophysicist, was he got to the end of the movie and the ship sank. And he said, I'm sitting there in this giant screen looking up there. And lo and behold, you could look above the ship and there's all the stars in the night sky. And you could see all these constellations. He said, but then I had this moment of horror. There's only two sets of constellations you can put up there either the Northern Hemisphere constellations or the Southern Hemisphere constellations. Which do you think they had up there? <laughs> they had the wrong stars. And he said, I sat up and looked around the theater and I couldn't figure out how could these people be enjoying this movie with the wrong <laughs> stars in it? <laughs> so then he said, you know, five years later, he's walking down the street in New York City and he looks over and who should he see but James Cameron, the director of that movie, and he goes over to him and he says, Mr. Cameron, you don't know me. I'm an astrophysicist. I loved your movie, but you got the stars wrong. And he said, Cameron took this in, thought for a moment, and he said, oh my God, you're right. And you know what? If we'd gotten those stars right, we would have made another $200 million at the box office. <laughs> and then he turned around and walked away. Um, and so then another five years goes by and Neil says he's sitting in his office. The phone rings. He picks it up. This guy says, I'm a producer working with James Cameron on the 10-year DVD anniversary special edition of Titanic. And Mr. Cameron says, we need to fix our stars, and you're the guy that can tell us what's wrong with the stars. <laughs> so there you go. Um, a story that illustrates the need for scientific accuracy in the movies. But more importantly, 
is once you hear that story, if you could have heard it told by him that day in that room with 250 Hollywood people just howling with laughter, um, there's more to it than just the fact that he knows how to tell a good story. There, after the fact you look at, there's a, a very set structure under that story. And in the literary world, they talk about this three-act structure as being very simple, three things. Thesis, antithesis, synthesis. You present the topic that you're interested in, you explore it and even take us to the worst possible scenario, and then at the end you come back and you bring it all together and you synthesize your main message. All of those things are in his simple little story there. He presents the problem at the beginning that the stars are wrong in Titanic. In the second act, he takes us on an albeit short journey to the very worst possible place, which is the idea that the most important director in the entire world doesn't even care about the accuracy of the stars. And then in the third act, he brings his background, turns out that Cameron did care, he just couldn't change it that moment on the street of New York City, and then eventually he did get around to this. And that gives you the synthesis of, you know, it is, there is hope for improving the accuracy of science in movies. But more importantly is appreciating there is this underpinning structure. And what you need to work on is the idea of using that underpinning structure, these templates of how stories are told. And that leads now to something that I think, and I, Time may prove me to be wrong on this, but I think this is the most practical piece of storytelling advice ever, at least for the science world, and something that I wish I could blast it out to every person in the entire world right now. I wish I could get it in every, every science textbook right this moment. Uh, so can I offer up any more hype than that? Um, and here's the most important thing about this most practical piece of storytelling advice ever is who it comes from. It comes from this guy. Um, <laughs> And actually not specifically from this guy, but from his creator, which is this guy, Trey Parker, and his co-creator, Matt Stone. And so this comes from last fall, Comedy Central ran a half an hour special about the making of this, sh this animated series, Sh South Park. They've been doing it for 15 years, and it was called Six Days to Air. They've gotten to the point now where they've shrunk the whole process down to just six days it takes them to make an entire episode. It used to take them three weeks per episode because of technology, now they can do it very quickly. Um, and so in the course of this t half an hour special, they end up following them in the making of an episode. And then they walk into Trey Parker's office in the middle of the night. They're pulling an all-nighter, and he's sitting behind the desk. And I'm going to show you this 45-second clip from that show. And there's kind of two parts to it. The first part, he's sort of setting this up, what he's going to say. And it's kind of blah, blah, blah. It's not the important part. The important part is the second part, what, what he calls his rule of replacement. So listen closely, and here we have it. This is going to end up being about a 40 page script, I think, which just means it just becomes brutal because you have to go back in tomorrow and start as you're coming up with new stuff and you've got to start taking scenes that are there and figuring out, okay, how can we make the same thing happen in half the time and rewrite it? And, and I so, sort of always call it the rule of replacing ands with either buts or therefores. And so it's always like this happens and then this happens and then this happens. Whenever I can go back in the writing and change that to this happens, therefore this happens, but this happens. <laughs> Whenever you can replace your ands with buts or therefores, it makes for better, right? Okay, so notice first thing, he, the inflection of his voice, a but, but this happens. There, there's, there's a significance to that. So replacing ands with buts and therefores. Now, what do I mean in terms of this being powerful for broad communication? Um, it is about this same basic structure, three-act structure, for communicating information here. And the first thing to realize is the word and is your expositional word. Like I was saying, you connect all this information together with the word and. The word but is where you establish a source of tension or conflict, and then therefore is eventually a synthesis word. You're bringing things together. So think of this in terms of, let me just show you how this works for any of you giving a talk at a scientific meeting. Um, I will give you two versions of a talk one with this or one without this and then one with this. So, so imagine I'm going to give a talk and I'm going to stand up here and I'm going to say, I work on ice coring in the Arctic and here's a picture of our base camp and here's a picture of our drilling rig and here's a picture of one of our ice cores and here's a picture of our equipment that we use to analyze it with and here's a graph of this and here's a graph of this and, 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 and. And the whole audience after a while is nodding off and, 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 and this is not an exaggeration. You know, I was at a big symposium in January, one of four keynote speakers to a thousand scientists. The other three speakers gave talks that were overviews of their multi-investigator ecosystem studies. And every one of those things was, and here's this person's work on this, and here's this person, and here's a graph of this, and, and, and. It is a problem when you're in that information mode of the scientists. But 
it doesn't work very effectively for communication. So the question is, can you use a different approach as a scientist? And here you know, is the answer to now imagine I give the same talk and I begin my talk by saying, I work on ice coring in the Arctic and here's a picture of our drilling rig and here's one of our ice cores. But last year, a laboratory in Idaho published a paper saying that the way we're doing this is completely wrong and everything that we've done the last 10 years is meaningless. Therefore, this season, we're now doing these experiments. Well, in setting that up, in that structure, I have caught your interest. You've, po you've got a question burning in your mind now, which is who's right? You know, the Idaho people that say that you're, everything's wrong or you or what are you going to do about this? And the people may have been about to fall asleep, but they're at least going to hang in there until they get an answer to that question. That's the whole idea of questions beg for answers. Um, and that's the power of this. And so then you take a look back at the typical scientist giving that talk and what the scientists would do. I know this is they would go through all that stuff. And then the, the bit about the lab in Idaho would be tacked on at the end. Um, and at the end of the talk, oh, and by the way, there's a lab in Idaho that thinks that this is all wrong. Um, so you might want to put it at the end there to diminish the importance of it. But a storyteller would see, wait a second, you know, if we take this thing and move it all the way to the front and play this game of holding out the information, you can keep the audience engaged and thinking along with you in the, the thought process. And that's what you want through the communication. So and button, therefore. And this is such a powerful, simple tool because it is a way to collapse everything down. And it may not be exactly the way you need to present your stuff, but it's a good starting point for you. If you have to give a presentation, you've got 10 tons of experiments that you've done you got to shrink it down to something like this. So people, and people talk about, you know, you need to know what your elevator pitch is. So they, and they use this all the time in communications workshops. The elevator pitch is the idea you're stuck in an elevator with somebody and you've got 30 seconds between floors to tell them what you do. Well, the problem with all these workshops and whoever asked me about the Aldo Leopold workshops, I don't think that they teach this. I don't think that they've come across it, but this is a tool to structure the logic of the, the elevator pitch so that you've actually got some means you're putting around. Because I've gone to these websites and looked at some of these books on the elevator pitch and all that they say is it needs to be concise. You know, you need to be enthusiastic about it. You really need to get to the point and not, but, but they don't give you this template. This is a template. So how does it work? I've already run this, you know, this has only been the last two or three months I'm doing. This is why I'm becoming increasingly enthusiastic about it because I'm seeing it put to practical use. Uh, and people are sending me emails after these talks and after that thing, uh, that big symposium, and I posed it to the audience. I said, you know, how many of you in the next three days are going to give a talk that's nothing but a bunch of ands? I want you to go back to your room tonight and think, is there any way, just as Trey Parker said, could you replace one of those ands with a but or therefore and make what you're telling a little more complex and compelling? Um, so, and furthermore, this idea of this template, um, this is not nonsense. <laughs> this is the real world, and I ran this by one of my friends in Hollywood who said, well, yeah, you know, you, you do know about the log line maker. And I said, no, the log line is your usually one or two sentence description of what your entire movie is about. Uh, these guys who are big time screenwriters, they spend their whole life going into the studios. They go in a room with a bunch of producers. They get about 20, 30 minutes to pitch all their things. And they've got to be able to have like 10 or 15 movies, each of which they start with the log line. Okay, it's a story about a guy who's trapped in a building, does this, 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 this. And they got to get through the whole story in two or three sentences. And it's got to make your imagination flare up. Um, and so here's one of these templates that's called a log line maker. And this is how you put together, you know, this is one template for making an action movie on the verge of blank. A blank is blank and blank and blank. But when he blank, he must learn blank before blank. Um, on, on the verge of this building blowing up, a humble marine biologist is sitting in his office answering emails and looks out um, and, you know, is caught up in, in answering memos. But when he looks out in the hall and sees a terrorist run by, he must learn what that terrorist just did down the hall uh, before the entire building blows up. And now he's running around asking people, what did that terrorist do? There is the beginnings of an action story starring a marine biologist. Um, <laughs> and it is that simple. This is how you put together these big budget action movies. But notice what's at the core of this thing. And I, I'm telling you, tons of these people use these things. And at the core of it is those same two words, and, but, uh, and this is really kind of therefore down there. So I, two months ago, I did these workshops with doctors called uh, for the Society for Hospital Medicine, something that kind of emanated out of the CDC work. And we have 80 doctors and we work with them for a day. I bring an improv instructor with me. We, we do a lot of storytelling exercises with them. 
one of the exercises I do is have them pair off and tell each other the story of their finest moment, uh, their finest professional moment. Tell me the story of that day, that one moment when everything in your training all came to bear and you did something that you'll never forget. So, you know, lots of them are, are stories of the emergency room. They're incredible. You sit and listen to these doctors and you realize, you know, day in and day out what they deal with. But what was interesting in doing this this year, that exercise with them, uh, was what I call the story of misdiagnosis. And four of these guys got up and they told their story and they were stories of misdiagnosis. And, and I realized instantly, oh my goodness, their whole story fits right into this template of and button therefore. So what a typical story was, uh, this woman walked into my office and she said she had this symptom and this symptom and this symptom and the doctors had diagnosed it as being this disease. But I noticed she had this symptom, therefore I went over and called three of my doctor colleagues and they all said that's a misdiagnosis. And so their stories fit right into that template, but more importantly was each of those guys took five minutes to tell their story with all this extraneous detail. And when they were done, I said, that's nice, but now let's go back and just pick out the core elements here to tell your story in the simplest number of words and get it down to a single sentence like that, and it works. And so over and over again, I encourage you to think about that, your own research project. You have it there, more than likely. If you're investigating any hypotheses, you should be able to say, I'm working on this and this, but recently I've noticed this, therefore I'm now investigating this. That's the core of the science that you do, and that is the way in which it integrates with storytelling in the same basic principles. Um, and so now to get back to this thing that I hid away from you, the answer, yes, in fact, that is my father. He's 94 years old. This is what I'm doing now, this uh, project I've been doing for two years, and it's about his experiences in World War II. It's a huge movie. We'll be releasing it, sending it to film festivals later this year. Um, and I'm learning a ton about storytelling from this. It's an amazing journey. It's a huge movie. Um, but it's got me thinking of a, a number of different things, and I'll, I'll maybe tell you later a few anecdotes from this. I told one in the discussion group this morning about uh, one of these old guys and his storytelling that, that he's kind of honed these stories so well over time. But it's also got me thinking in terms of combat and war. And I'm good friends with Mike Mann. I interviewed him a couple years ago on my website, The Benchy. Um, he's been the climate scientist that's kind of in endured the worst firestorm of, of attacks from all of the anti-science movement, the anti-climate science movement. He's at Penn State University, um, and he published this book just a few weeks ago, The Hockey Stick and the Climate Wars. When I did this long interview with him a couple years ago, he used these terms. He said, we are at war. You know, this is an all-out assault. These people from the right wing, from the Heartland Institute, from these other places, they are taking all their resources to figure out how to kick the legs out from under this entire climate science movement and the entire profession of science is under attack from this, or climate science is under attack. There's just no doubting about that. Um, and so it's, it's actually a very serious issue, I think. And the more that I've gotten to know this, the more I find it very disconcerting. Um, but it's also a byproduct of several things. And it's made worse, first off, by a rapidly changing communications environment. We communicate so differently today than 10 to 15 years ago. It's made worse by a profession, science, that traditionally does not value communications, just thinks that, you know, and that science folks had their way in the 60s and 50s, 60s and 70s where they didn't have to worry about communicating. Everybody respected science in our society back then. I was a graduate student back then. I mean, have we not been through a bizarre transition? I mean, could you have pictured in the 70s and 80s what's going on today with, I mean, seriously, yeah. No, you could not, your it was beyond your imagination even in the 80s, that there would come a day where the entire climate consensus of the science community says we need to pass legislation reducing emissions and the general public rises up to erase all legislative efforts in Congress and the environmental movement bungles everything so much that nothing is happening anymore. They've all given up on it. Um, and um, at the core of that is I feel, and my movie tomorrow night, uh, Sizzle, is about this ineptitude with communications and the consequences of it, and it's, it's very difficult, but when it's not taken seriously enough, when you're not willing to engage in professional approaches to it, you end up with these sorts of things. And here's an example just a month ago. Um, this was a paper that was in Science, and my friend Chris Mooney posted on it, and I, um, on the title of it, and I came across his post, and I totally agreed with him, and I put a comment on there. So this was something, um, you know, a whole bunch of scientists on this thing, and the title of their paper was Navigating the Anthropocene, Improving Earth System Governance. Um, the Earth System Governance, you know, 
you didn't have to word it that way. And all through the paper, they talk about global governance and what this is idea, the idea is about is that we need to get all the nations of the world together into a single government that's going to rule the world. Well, could you think of any worse language for the Tea Party and the right wing in this country right now? And why didn't you at least bring in one communications person from the non-science world who could have looked at your title and your language and said, don't do this, you're antagonizing these people. And these sorts of blunders happen with scientists over and over again. And of course, in Chris's discussion on his blog about that, a bunch of scientists weighed in furious and said, we shouldn't have to worry about how we word our papers in science. Well, you do now. We have this thing called the internet and all the opponents have got access to everything you're saying and doing and they're using it as ammunition. And again, you know, on the one hand, you want that right to not have to worry about what you say, but on the other hand, you demand the right to be furious day in and day out about why won't these people listen to us about carbon emissions and all this sort of stuff. The two are interconnected. And at the core of it are these communication dynamics. And again, both of my movies, they're not about science very much. They're about communication. And this communication stuff comes down a lot to personalities. And it comes down to these fundamental processes of communication, uh, namely storytelling that's a couple thousand years old. And at the core of it are a few simple principles. We're not at the point yet of storyomics on an entire science of it, but there's at least that one basic principle of and, button, therefore. And why in the world the science world has never talked about this, this has never been brought up, you've not heard it in your science courses, and yet it's so simple and fundamental. Um, I do not know, but that's at the core of the communication challenge for science communication, I think, these days. So on that lovely note, um, I am interested in hearing your thoughts, comments, and questions. Before I forget, I want to invite everyone to the post-presentation reception on the second floor of the library. So. Cool. Okie doke. So we had a discussion earlier that went, you know, filled an hour easily. So let's pick up from there. Yes. Okay. Well, so one another aspect of storytelling that people are always told to take into account is their audience. Yes. And scientists communicate not just to the same audience all the time. Sometimes to experts within a very narrow area of research, and other times trying to communicate with the general public. So. I, I think that what you're saying about storytelling applies in no matter what the audience is, but how do you see audience fitting into that? And my other thing is, can you think of an alternative title on the spot to that paper? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's not fair. <laughs> okay, you don't have to take me up on that one. I'm more. Um. <laughs> give, give me a few minutes, I definitely could come up with something other than that. I mean, it's just. Earth system governance, that's, that's the problem there, you know, a buzzword, and global governance. I, I was thinking that we should take up the biblical notion that we're the stewards of the Earth and use that instead of governance. But anyway. Certainly. So that, more interested in what you have to say about audience. Yes, okay. Um, okay, so in terms of audience, um, yeah, the, the starting point is to, um, you know the word grok? Anybody remember that from, what was that, Stranger in a Strange Land? Um, uh, it was a sci-fi novel back in the, I guess I'm dating myself, um, <laughs> long, long ago. Robert Heinlein. Robert Heinlein, exactly, yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, is this idea of somehow, like gestalting, of somehow absorbing the concept so thoroughly that you kind of absorb it all the way from cerebral to the visceral, blah, blah, blah. And that's what I'm saying about this idea of storytelling, which is that to understand that the hypothetical deductive method is nothing more than storytelling. You know, it's the posing of hypotheses and testing them and then coming to conclusions. And if you can start to relax those barriers and realize how much there is to be learned from the world of humanities and to get over the story phobia um, and to know that we're all humans and these basic elements, that you then see that it, I really, I, I'm suggesting the term of um, like logic structuring instead of story, storytelling. So we need a euphemism for storytelling for the science world. Clearly the word story is too charged up with the idea of lying and Hollywood and exaggeration. And in, when I published my book, the new scientists reviewed it and they, the reviewer said I was advocating bending the science to tell, to tell better stories. And I had to write a rebuttal and say no. On page 111 I say I would never support anything short of 100% accuracy in the communication of science. Um, it's not that. It's that there is this structure of, of logic that enables you to get information into people's brains quicker. And so even in the most complex, intense science thing, 
that structure still works and button therefore, you know, and especially if you can begin a presentation with it, you know, to get people to understand what you're talking about, because I'm telling you, it's so hard for me nowadays that I've been living in Hollywood for 15 to 20 years and my mind is geared more towards this rapid communication, but I still come do all these visits and work with science people and things like that. And when you've got a scientist who doesn't take one bit of interest in this idea of structuring information and just feels the, the right to simply spew out you know, facts and facts and facts, and it becomes the fundamental question of who will bear the burden of, of broad communication. Um, Am I going to, are you going to give me the right to spew out information and it's up to you people to put it together into a story that makes sense? Or am I going to spend some time in the past two weeks putting this together into a story that you can instantly absorb? Um, and, and it works like that. So, you know, two months ago I spoke to the, what was the Union of Concerned Scientists, their National Advisory Board, and I gave you know, a version of this talk in the morning, the first thing, and I presented that thing, and button therefore. The next woman who got up, she said, all right, I'm going to do something crazy here. You know, I'm going to see if I can present my hour-long talk right now to you using this thing. And she said, I'm going to talk to you about this and this, but this, therefore, what I'm really going to get into is this. And it worked. It's like a synopsis. You know, it's an abstract. It's the same thing as you're doing with a scientific paper. And so the more nowadays, and particularly, um, you have to know that the brains of even the best scientists are different today than they were 10 or 15 years ago. Everybody's doing Twitter and Facebook and all this junk, the whole metabolism of information flow in our society is accelerated. The, the assimilation level is declining. You know, you guys know tons of papers you're writing aren't getting cited. People aren't digesting the stuff as much as they used to. People aren't reading all the literature as well. So these are elements that are very relevant to your lives today. And the quicker you can be understood from the first moment, the better the chance of actually getting something across to more people and even with the most sophisticated audience. Um, and again, how much time are you burning up in a science talk to open up with a sentence? You know, I'm here to talk to you about this and this, but this, therefore I'm gonna get into this. Um, know that that is a structure of logic, which I appreciate now. And increasingly, I'm getting the point now where people write to me a two-page pitch about their you know, whole media campaign, like the thing I'm involved with, these people with a dolphin species. And I'm gonna start writing back and say, you know, let's re reboot this thing. Why don't you write back to me and start with a single sentence that has fit this template so I can get what you're doing so I don't have to sit here for the next 20 minutes plowing through paragraph after paragraph. Trying, what, are you, what exactly are you working on? Get to the point. Um, any of that making sense? It, it really is. It's getting the point. Let me add another tidbit to this because I gave this talk three times in Vancouver two weeks ago, uh, three different groups, and the same question came up twice in the groups, which is um, we write science papers. And we can't do this suspenseful thing of holding out the answer to the end of the paper because we have to put a, a synopsis at the beginning of the paper, an abstract, I mean. And you have to tell in the abstract what your point is. You know, you can't write an abstract that says, we did a bunch of research on ant foraging and the details will, will emerge when you read this paper. Uh, <laughs> that wouldn't work for an abstract. You have to tell, this is what we found, this is what it means. It's all gotta be in there. Um, so does that spoil the experience? Well, you know, how many of you went to see the movie Titanic not certain whether the ship really would sink or not? <laughs> um, it's the same basic dynamic. And when I was in film school in 1995, um, a bunch of my classmates, somebody was working at Universal, I think, and they, 20th Century Fox, they got a copy of the script of Titanic and everybody passed it all around. And instantly, you know, like little film school students, they have to come up with their one-line buzz about, you know, why this movie's going to tank. And everybody said, it, nobody's going to go see it, you know. There's, there's no suspense to it, you know. The ship sinks. We know it already. Why would you buy a ticket to see a movie where you already know the ending, that the ship sinks? Well, maybe because there's a different dynamic at work there in terms of, of storytelling. And it's the same thing with writing a science paper. Um, giving away your conclusion in your abstract is no different than going to see Titanic and knowing that the movie's going to sink. The question is, can you tell a story still that has that narrative flow and structure to it? And you will get, you know, if you do a great job of it, your reader will get to the you know, middle of the results and they'll have forgotten what they read in the abstract. They'll be so engrossed in, yeah, God, I wonder how this does turn out or whatever. So it is the same basic principles um, at work there. And they're universal, even though scientists you know, don't want to concede that. Um, that's my, my thought about that in terms of audience. Of course, it does matter with audience. Um, and, you know, I guess another thing to tell you about audience stuff is consider the idea of 
Um, I mean, getting to the point is super important, but the, also the idea of the reverse narrative. And a lot of times when you've got a really tense audience, you have to get right to the point. And I tell people, you know, sometimes friends will call me up and they're going to go on some TV talk show. And, you know, you got any advice on how to deal with this? And that's one of the first things I tell them. If you're going on a rapid fire news talk show with some host that's going to grill you, um, you have to go with the reverse narrative. You know, if they're going to ask you, is this oil spill going to have an effect on the California coast? You can't say, well, oil spills are this complex process, blah, 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 blah. You instantly lose the viewers. You have to say, yes, it is going to have an effect. It's going to have a big effect. It's going to affect everything from the top of the state to the bottom. You have to expand out and accordion out from there, but you have to begin by grabbing attention, by answering the question, getting to the point like that. And I would suggest that there's some element of that in when you're giving a talk to your biggest experts. Because again, you know, I know, I was a scientist. I remember giving those talks and you've got 100 people in the audience and you're really only speaking to the five people that are in your field and those people are bored with your introduction and you've got to get right to the point of, of them. So sometimes you strategically need to, to go ahead and lose them. Um, and that's, that's really getting to the point of what you're asking about. Is there a different mode? And, and there, there definitely is in that stuff. So, yeah. Another thought question? Yes. So we have a college of liberal arts and sciences that has sciences and humanities. And we have students with a core curriculum. <laughs> and every student has to take science and humanities, which could include communication. But, but. <laughs> we don't require any kind of the activity that you're suggesting. So if we buy into your, if, if you therefore, 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 <laughs> therefore, if we buy into what you're saying, buy into your your pitch. Yes. Therefore, we need to do something. What should we, could we do, based on what other institutions are doing, or is any institution doing anything? <clears throat> to bring together. The, um, to improve the communication of science to non-science audiences. Uh, the science audience. I really, I do think that it begins with a sensitization towards this topic of storytelling. And to understand, you know, I, I made light of it in the beginning there, but these vestiges. And this is a real thing, you know. I don't know why nobody's pointed this out. And somebody someday ought to try and figure out a way to go back in time and figure out, when did these journals first start coming up with guidelines for writers? Who was the first person who ever said, we've got to have one section that's introduction, we've got to have these two things, methods and results, and then we've got to have a discussion. Um, where did that all begin? That was the start of the branch there. And whoever came up with that, you know, was probably somebody who'd done a lot of writing, read a, a ton of novels, and had the same basic instincts. Um, so I think that it begins with stories and storytelling, story structure. Storytelling is just such a universal thing. And again, take all this with a grain of salt. You know, I've been living in and around Hollywood for 20 years. I may be mentally ill at this point, probably am. <laughs> um, so be forewarned. But this is the, the most important thing to, talk, to take away from this is that this crazy man came, talked to us. He used to be a scientist, became a filmmaker. And what he told us was that after this 30-year exploration, he boils it all down to one word, that word, one word is story. And, you know, the, just look at the Greeks, look at all these sorts of things, look at how universal story is. Um, by the way, you know, I should put this into my talk there, but any of you are making any notes on this sort of stuff, uh, Martin Palmer is a guy from the UK who gave a talk last November at the World Wildlife Fund had their 50 year anniversary and they invited me to come speak about science communication. And I thought I had a cool talk until I sat through his talk, which was light years better than mine. And he is involved with this group that is, um, it's religion and conservation. And around the world, they partner with these religious groups to try and get them to do conservation stuff. And they find in many of these countries that religions are far more powerful than our politics. And, you know, he talks about examples in Cambodia that the Buddhist monks will go out into a forest and they will ordain the trees as monks themselves. And as soon as that happens, no one will touch the trees. And then the UN comes along and says, nobody log this for us. And everybody just says, ah, get out of here. And they log it away. Um, religious things are so powerful with humans. And as he says, um, at the core of all that, um, people, his, his little standard soundbite is 85% of the world's population gets their daily values and norms from stories which they learn from their religions. You know, 85% of the world is deeply religious. Why wouldn't you figure out this channel of communication of how stories work? So I do think, to answer your question, the onus is largely on you guys on the science side, which is to realize that they have something that can be of value to you, which is how stories work. 
and you do need probably some interpreters like myself that can help you see these parallels because I think I hope that's what I'm helping a lot of science people do to break down this you know this oil and water effect between the arts and the sciences and, um, and humanities but they're the ones that have got something that you can, can get and, and they need you because you've got the substance that they're all lacking um, and all you gotta do is go to Hollywood and just listen to these people if you come to my movie tomorrow night sizzle you know it's a mockumentary it opens up with this scene of these two producers that say they're gonna finance my movie and one of them says to me, he says, you know, we're, we're really, really worried and upset about this topic of global warming. Uh, we just don't know why we're so worried and upset. And that's a line that I wrote based on my experiences in Hollywood for the last 20 years of all these people, all these celebrities and filmmakers that really want to save the planet. They're so upset about these social issues. But more often than that, they don't even begin to understand what the issue is. They just know they're upset about, you know, global warming, whatever it is, it's really upsetting. Um, and that's because they lack the substance. So they have what you have, you know, you have to offer what they need, which is some substance. And that's why they are intrigued with the sciences. You know, artists are endlessly fascinated by, by science. It's so substantive. Um, and so I think exploring that partnership, what the two sides have to offer and to know that that I think if you want one practical thing you can get from the art people, it's this storytelling as a means of communication. But be also be forewarned that it took me 20 years, really, to get to the point where I am right now of respecting the importance of story and storytelling. Because when we started film school, 1993, they told us from day one, most important thing you can do is learn how to tell stories. That you, you all need to, you're going to be here three years. The most important thing to do when you get out is not to have some cool film that you think is hip and wonderful. You need to have three really well written screenplays that tell brilliant stories because the only thing people in Hollywood are going to write or hire you for is as a screenwriter because if they wanted a film director they're going to hire somebody from the music video or commercial world. All of us ignored that advice. All of us said we're so brilliant as directors you know we don't need to learn how to write and now here I am 20 years later saying God they were right. Um, storytelling is the be all and end all. So. That's my suggestion on that. Um, was it you were going to ask something? I was, was going to just say, I think one of the only ways in which societies do tell good stories is when they write grants. Because you almost have to. Yes. To yes. So. I know exactly why that is. <laughs> right. So, right. Yes. So we have to tell stories. We have to get money. We have to get something from someone yes. else. Yes. So why? Let, let me take it from there, or, yeah. and then we can come back. You can pose a question. Um, you know, one of the bitter things that I left behind in my science career um, was writing grants. I hated that, hated that process. And the thing I hated worst, I think, was talking to program officers who just, they would say this over and over again, why do we care, you know? You're working on starfish larvae. Why do we care about starfish larvae? You gotta make us care about larvae. Um, guess what, that's the same language that crops up in screenwriting, in big, you know, big budget, movies is okay we got this character why do we care what happens to this character you know this this woman is out here on a ledge why do we care if she jumps off or not oh god we care because we've told you the whole backstory about how she this that and the other thing um, and again you begin to see the parallels and at the core of that is this question of what's at stake you know that's what makes us care and as I work more and more in the story development stuff with people I hear the voices echoing back from those people I hated at NSF, the program officers, you know, that they destroyed my entire science career by rejecting my grants and having me on the phone saying, why should we care about starfish library? Oh, God, um, it's so bad. I mean, I have these nightmares, you know, I'm in a room with all these program officers. Why do we care? Why do we care? Um, but it's so true. And it's the same basic dynamic. And so that's again why, you know, I'm telling you, if you went and took some screenwriting courses and learned story structure really well, it would begin to manifest itself in your ability to write grant proposals. You would start to understand this thing. And another part of this thing about why do we care is the question of what's at stake. And the further extrapolation of that that's really a practical part to use in developing stories is not only what's at stake, but we need you to paint the picture for us of what will happen in this world if this thing doesn't happen. Um, you know, this guy has got to go find the bomb that the terrorist uh, planted and it might help, you know, make the fire bigger if I can paint a picture for you that if this bomb goes off, it turns out we've got 10 of the world's top diplomats in the building right now and the world is going to be devastated. So that's what's at stake. That's why we care about this thing, you know. It's very different if, than if I tell you it's the weekend and there's nobody in the building anyhow, who cares. Um, and it's the same deal with writing grant proposals, which is what's at stake and why do we need to do this research. And basically, you know, you want to take that further. 
what's going to happen in the world if they don't give you this money to do this thing? You know, we've got this problem. We need to conserve this species of tree in these forests. And if we don't figure out, you know, how these things reproduce, then we're going to end up with a forest missing this species, and then the whole ecosystem is going to collapse. That's the same storytelling dynamics that you do in grant proposal of taking that thing and extrapolating on out and painting a picture for the grant people and that lights a fire inside of them, motivates them. Um, again, this is a huge opportunity that the science world really hasn't taken advantage of and that's why, and the bizarre thing is that I have been there for 20 years in Hollywood and they are a bunch of short attention span lunatics running all over the place um, and you go to enough cocktail parties and you want to strangle some of them um, and as a result, academics stay away in droves. You don't see the science world out there trying to tap that knowledge, but the science world's reaching a crisis point in some of these fields. And, um, you know, they're just sitting around saying, this is how it ought to be. We don't know why it's not like this. There ought to be carbon emissions limitations. People ought to be responding to what we're saying about climate. Um, there shouldn't be schools passing new laws to allow everybody to debate evolution in the state of Tennessee. Um, there shouldn't be these sorts of things, but there are, and it means that your agenda is not coming across persuasively, I think. Yes. I have a question. You mentioned earlier on that filmmaking is a part of communicating science, and we already get used yeah. to that. And as you know, the Benthic Ecologists um, started a student film series a couple of years ago. Yeah. And I noticed among my colleagues, the old farts, you know, there was great resistance to this. Why are we wasting our time on this? These kids should be out collecting data. Why are they, why are they even doing this? And I saw this real divide, the old farts and the you know, young Turks. Yeah. And it has gotten better, and it has only gotten stronger, and it's only gotten bigger. They had an IMAX theater this year. For these oh, things. really? For, yeah. the, for the films? Yeah, so there you go. Yeah. what do you think about that? I mean, like, what, I mean, what do we do? <coughs> what are you going to do? The world is cha changing, and you can stay... You know, on that radio show I was on, on NPR, I referred to, you know, I said scientists are stuck in their Pleistocene mud or something like that, and I think that was the line that really angered the guy. Um, there, there's one person who will go nameless who's a major education person in the science education world um, who says to me over and over again, we are going to win this communication struggle one retirement at a time. Um, and there is, you know, there is that exactly, and this stuff matters. But I guess here's the first thing I would extrapolate it all the way back to is in the 1960s, P.B. Medawar, Nobel laureate, uh, wrote a paper called The Scientific Paper is a Fraud. And he, at the end of his distinguished career in the UK, um, was completely forlorn over the fact that as a scientist, you are forced to be a liar from the very beginning, no matter whether you, you know, are interested in communication. Um, science consists of two parts. Why every science textbook doesn't begin by telling you this, I don't know, but it's, there's two parts of science, the doing of science and then the communicating of science. If you go and do the science and gather tons and tons of notebooks with all this data, and then you go to your grave having never written up any of that stuff, you never did the science. And we have known scientists like that, you know, that you meet it, you listen to it in meetings and they've got all these notebooks. And one of these days I'm gonna write these papers up. Well, you didn't and it's over with. Um, so the second part is communication and it really isn't science until you've communicated it somehow, some way. And one of my great frustrations from the very beginning of graduate school, I remember my fellow graduate students, we'd go to these science meetings and we would sit there and watch these guys who will go nameless but did really rotten research, boring questions, you know, poorly done experiments, not controlled, yada, 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 but were great speakers and everybody would pack in there to hear them talk and we would say, we've read the papers, it's bad science, why? But these things matter. And so Medawar's thing that, that upset him was that to write an effective scientific paper. You can't report every experiment you did. You can't even put them in chronological order. You have to do this, this logic structuring that I'm talking about here. You've got to think what's the easiest way for people to understand the, the key point I'm getting towards. And you have to make these subjective decisions in which you leave out some stuff that you did. And I have been at scientific meetings and I've listened to somebody stand up and ask the speaker at the end of the talk, did you measure this? And the speaker says, well, yeah, of course. And the guy says, well, why didn't you put it in your talk? Because if you'd told us that, it would have changed everything here. And the scientist said, well, I didn't think it was that relevant. Um, those are all the subjective elements you're forced to do. And this is just the same thing. This is a more subjective way of communication is through films um, and videos. And everything's speeding up. Um, take your pick. You know, either 
go with the flow and work with it or just not be listened to. And uh, uh, you got thoughts on, on that? I'm an old dog. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not. It's hard for me to learn new tricks. Yeah, but you, you understand the basics of communication because of the conversations we've had. And, uh, you know, that's the, the starting point is to know this stuff. And it's, it is still frustrating. Um, and, I mean, I love Twitter, but I, I can't find the time to get on there very much. You know, I go on there and the next thing I'm following all these stupid things people are saying. Um, you know, it's just a big time sink. So that's a constraint. And I have to say, furthermore, of all my former colleagues, uh, I don't know any of them that do anything on Twitter. Um, you know, I don't know any of them that blog. They're, they're too busy doing really good science. And it's a concern. I don't know what this all leads to because it takes time to do all this stuff. It takes time to write good stories. You have to meditate and think. Storytelling itself is a puzzle solving process. It's incredibly complex. This World War II movie that I'm doing right now, we've been at it for two years, basically. And I go out surfing. I, you know, I'm a fanatic surfer and I sit out there and think for hours and that's the most important part of it. And I will come back in and call my editor immediately and say, you know, presto, I just had this revelation. If we move this piece over to here, these two puzzle pieces suddenly come together. And I know we're going to have a good movie because we spent two years of he and I just nonstop thinking, thinking, thinking. And what happens when we end up with a society where nobody can find the time to do that, which has already happened a lot. Um, I remember watching the uh, the movie Blue Velvet on the home DVD version, they've got a documentary, The Making of Blue Velvet, one of my all-time favorite movies, and David Lynch is talking about what they did to make that movie. They went and moved and took over a small logging town in North Carolina for three months, and they put the entire cast there, and it was the mid-'80s when there were no cell phones, no internet, no nothing, and they lived and breathed the story for three months. And guess what? You know, when everybody focuses that much, you begin to reach higher and higher levels of synthesis and amazing things. Um, I'm not quite sure what happens in a short attention span world where nobody can focus that much. And that's, you know, that's a worry. The video stuff is a different mode of communication, um, plays differently like that. But in, in general, it it's, doesn't even matter if it's important or not, it's happening. You know, you can't fight the tide with that. And uh, I'll tell you one of the, the immediate uh, symptoms. Actually, just on Tuesday, I did an interview for this documentary down in Jacksonville, Florida, and the young guy that I hired for it, um, he's making a whole living now doing uh, videos for book authors. And just three years ago, when I published my book, I had the novelty of, we shot a video for myself because I'm a filmmaker, and we made our own little three-minute video we put on the website, and the Island Press people were thrilled with that. Well, in just three years' time now, that's changed totally. Every author now, you have to have a video for your book. And there's all these production guys like this guy now that will shoot the video for you for your book. Uh, it was a novelty three years ago, now it's obligatory. That's, there's a sign of the times. And then, is this not the case? Aren't a lot of you hearing this from your programs from NSF and things like that, that, that they want your outreach stuff now, they want you to do videos? Um, I certainly get tons of people coming to me saying, can you help us make a you know, video that will work? Um, and again, at the core of all that is, is storytelling, so. Our, uh, our hosts in the business school have an event here at <laughs> five o'clock, and I, I, I want to be gracious and give them time to set up. So let's thank Randy and, and invite Thanks. everyone.